We're ready to make the next stop in our journey through suffix indexes. We've just seen the suffix tree. And of course, we like the suffix tree in terms of the space required because its big O space required was an improvement over the suffix try. So whereas the suffix try required a quadratic number of nodes and edges, the suffix tree requires only a linear number of nodes and edges and its overall linear space structure. So that was a big advance when we moved from the suffix try to the suffix tree. However, today we're going to find we're going to see something that's smaller even than the suffix tree in practice. We're going to see why it's smaller and we're going to define what it is and then we'll we'll be able to learn more about how to query it and such in later videos and and this is the suffix array that we're going to learn about today. And uh, it's actually fairly simple to describe compared to the suffix tree. The suffix array is pretty, pretty easy to uh, describe. So let's start with the definition. Okay, so as always, we have our text T, and our suffix array data structure is going to be an array of integers from 0 up to M, the length of the string T, in order according to the lexicographical or alphabetical, in other words, order of T's suffixes. Right, so we're just putting integers into an array. Those integers represent offsets of t, right? offsets of suffixes of t, and we're just going to write them in alphabetical order. So we're going to write these offsets in alphabetical order. Plus, the index is also going to contain t itself. Okay, so we'll come back to this, but because the array only contains these offsets, we still need to keep around the actual content of of t. So we need to store t and we need to store this array of integers. Okay, so to help us fill in this array, let me just bring in a uh, sort of uh, another string here, which is the offsets of the suffixes, right? So it's a little bit easier to refer to suffixes by their offset. And let's just go ahead and figure out what should be the order we put them in. What's the lexicographical or alphabetical order of these suffixes? And recall the rule that when we add this dollar sign onto the end, dollar sign is less than all the other characters in the alphabet. Okay, so for example, let's just imagine that we're using this ordering where dollar sign comes first, then comes A, then comes B. So, which of the suffixes of the text is the first one alphabetically among all the suffixes? Well, it's the one that starts at offset 6 because that one starts with dollar sign and dollar sign is the smallest of all the characters. So we're going to put a 6 here in the very first element of the suffix array. Okay, let's see if we can find the next longest suffix, or the next largest suffix in terms of alphabetical order. So this was, let me just write the suffix here to the side. This was the suffix dollar sign. Well, I think the next one is going to be the one at offset 5, which is A followed by dollar sign. Right? We've already got the suffix that starts with dollar sign, and there's only one such suffix. There's no more of those. So the next bunch of suffixes that we're going to put in, in order to keep alphabetical order, are going to be the ones that start with A. And the first among all of those are the ones that have dollar sign right after the A. Right? That's going to be the next one alphabetically, so I'll put a 5 here, and that corresponds to A dollar sign. Okay, all right, what's the next longest one? Well, there's three more A's here. Two of the A's have a B right after them, but one of the A's has an A right after them. So the A that has an A right after it will come next in alphabetical order. So that's the suffix at offset 2. I'm going to put a 2 here, and that corresponds to the suffix A, A, B, A, dollar. Okay, now we've got the two suffixes that start with A, B. They both start with A, B, A, in fact. A, B, A, A, B, A, but this one has a dollar sign next, whereas this one has an A next. So the one that has a dollar sign next wins, so that's the one at offset 3. So we're going to put 3, and that's the suffix A, B, A, dollar. And then this next one is 0, and it's the suffix A, B, A, A, B, A, dollar. And now what's left are the two suffixes that start with B. One of them starts with BAA, the other one starts with BA dollar sign. So BA dollar sign is alphabetically the smaller one, so I'm going to put a 4 there. And then finally we have 1. 
for B A A B A dollar sign. Okay. All right. So there's our suffix array, and I've drawn it both as numbers and next to it, I drew the actual suffixes referred to by those numbers, the actual suffixes at those offsets. But it's important for me to remind you the actual data structure is just the array of numbers plus t itself, those two things together. We don't actually need to store all these characters over here, which is a good thing because, as we know, we would need quadratic space to actually store each of the suffixes written out like that. Okay, so that's the idea. Pretty easy to define, and this is the data structure. I think you'll agree it's simpler conceptually than the suffix tree. Let's keep comparing it, though, to the suffix tree. So. Let's think, for example, about what the space bound is required for the suffix array and how that compares to the suffix tree. Well, what are we storing? We're just storing m integers in that array, right? m offsets in that array, right? These are m offsets right here. And we're storing m characters because we're storing t. So m integers, m characters, that's all we're storing. Pretty clearly, that's big O of m. All right, m integers, m characters, we're going to call that big O of m space, just like the suffix tree, right? The suffix tree, we eventually were able to argue that when you add everything up, the nodes, the edges, the labels on the edges, etc., maybe even the suffix links, you could add it all together and it would be big O of m at the end of the day. Here with the suffix array, it's quite clear and easy to see because of how conceptually simple it is that we also have a big O of m data structure here. Okay, so the suffix array is big O of m space, so was the suffix tree. So how do we start to compare them? How do we start to think about them with respect to each other? Well, let's ask a specific question. Big O of m does not tell us how quickly, how quickly it grows linearly. It only tells us that it grows linearly, right? Like, uh, uh, if the slope of this line is the rate at which the suffix tree gets bigger as we index, let's say, longer and longer prefixes of some sequence, like human chromosome 1. If that's what this looks like for the suffix tree, what will it look like for the suffix array? We know it'll be a line because, again, it's also big O of M. Um, but will it be a line that looks like, you know, this? In other words, it grows more slowly than the suffix tree as the text grows. Will it grow like this, just like the suffix tree? Maybe it'll grow like this, faster than the suffix tree? What do you think? Well, we can actually start to answer that question just by looking over here and comparing what the two data structures actually consist of. Okay, so remember these, these two pictures over here are a little bit of a um, shortcut, right? Because I've got, for example, string labels here, but we know that actually the edges are labeled with those pairs that tell you the offset and the run length of the substring with respect to t. Also, I drew these suffixes here, but we know that's not included in the data structure. But the important thing I want you to sort of focus on for a moment are the squares, right? So over on the side that has the suffix tree, the squares, of course, are the leaves, and they have to refer, they have to contain and, and, and encode the offset of the suffix that occurs at that leaf, right? Whereas over here in our suffix array, we've got also squares and they're also representing all the suffixes of our suffix array. So if we were literally storing suffixes at each of the leaves, which is what we said we would do, and this is literally just an array consisting of those same offsets, just in an array this time, then you can imagine this must be bigger than this, right? Because this has all of this, all of these integers here in the leaves, plus then some other stuff, right? The suffix tree also contains the internal nodes and the suffix tree also contains the edge labels and so on, right? So the suffix tree has everything that's in the suffix array plus more. So you have to imagine the suffix tree is gonna be bigger. In other words, it's gonna have a larger constant factor. In other words, we should expect that the suffix array is gonna grow more slowly compared to the suffix tree, which is what we see. So this is true in practice. So because the leaves of the suffix tree are basically equal in size to the suffix array, the everything else in the suffix tree, like the internal nodes, are just sort of extra, making the tree bigger 
than the corresponding suffix array. So this is the main motivation for why we would like to look at the suffix array. It seems to be, space-wise, an improvement over the suffix tree. It's not an asymptotic improvement. We're not doing better than big O of M. We're still doing big O of M, but it would seem to be a constant factor improvement over the suffix tree. So as a very concrete example, because I'm in genomics, I like to use genome examples. So for example, the human genome, let's say we wanted to build either a suffix tree or a suffix array of the human genome sequence. Well, the human genome sequence consists of about 3 billion letters, right? So the capital T here is just a big long string that's about 3 billion letters long. So if we were to encode that in a suffix array, we would need a suffix array element for each of those three billion suffixes of the string T. Because the human genome is about three billion letters long, what that means is that if you want to represent an offset into the human genome, you need obviously a certain number of bits. And in fact, the way you would compute it is you would take the log base two of three billion and round up to the nearest integer and that gets you 32, right? So you would need 32 bit integers to store those offsets. So if we did this, you know, 3 billion letters times 32-bit integers, each of which takes 4 bytes, right? 32 bits is 4 bytes. So multiply it out, you get 12 gigabytes. So an, a suffix array index of the human genome would occupy about 12 gigabytes. This is in contrast to suffix trees, which definitely take more than that, though exactly how much more is going to depend on how clever your implementation of the suffix tree is. I gave you one reference here at the bottom, which is of a, a piece of work that tries to uh, minimize as much as possible the space required by the suffix tree using clever tricks. And with an approach like that, you could probably get a suffix tree of the human genome to fit in something like 45 gigabytes. So factor of three or more bigger than the suffix array. In practice, a lot of real world implementations will be even bigger than that. Um, but this just gives you the impression that the suffix array is going to be some decent factor smaller than the corresponding suffix tree, perhaps making it much more practical for, you know, things like the human genome, very long sequences like the human genome compared to the suffix tree.